This is an issue that faces and challenges countries and agencies around the world. It impacts the elderly, <coughs> children, families, people like you and me that are simply trying to live their life in dignity and peace. A lot of people that we serve are fleeing um, gang violence in Central America. For our adults, we have people from um, all over the world, but for our children population, about 99% of our children are fleeing the countries of El Salvador, Honduras, and Guatemala. Uh, right now, El Salvador has the highest homicide rate in the world. Um, one in five families in El Salvador have been victims of violence. And so we see a lot of people fleeing for their lives. Um, one, one example I can give is a recent client of mine, I'll, I'll call her um, Daniela for today. So she um, was living in El Salvador. Her, her, um, her grandmother was her caretaker. Her grandmother ran um, a, sto a little store on the street selling um, drinks and snacks. And it happened to be across the street from the police station. And so in addition to her customer, she also served um, members of the police force. And the, the gangs in, in the area viewed that as a political act being against the gangs, the fact that she was providing goods to the police officers. The global refugee crisis right now, as you just heard, it's over 65 million people who fled their homes because of conflict and persecution and can't return home. And among those, about a third of them are refugees. They've fled to a neighboring country. And among those refugees, the average amount of time someone's a refugee is almost 20 years today. Children are the most vulnerable. We don't get to pick where, we bo where we're born. And, and if we did, we wouldn't pick poverty and we wouldn't pick a conflict zone. And yet, these children who were born into these situations through no decision that they made, no politics of their own, they are the most vulnerable in all of the situations. And for children in the camp, many of whom, as you've said, will spend their lifetime in that camp. You know, the 50 million people on the move, 29 million forcibly removed from their homes. We are losing an entire generation of children who should be in school and instead are sleeping on rocks. We did a little research and we found that there are a number of children, you know, people are going into Latin America, in particular in Guatemala, and saying to a mama who has five or six kids, you can't feed them, I will take one of your daughters and I will educate her in the United States, send her to me, I'll sponsor her, and then we'll find her a job eventually and she will send money back and we'll reunite the family and then that child is never heard from again. She's trafficked in the streets. And this is not a small problem, this is a huge problem in our country, right in our backyards right now. You made a really good point about how people don't have lawyers when they come. So um, there's no public defender system for immigrants in the process of getting deported. There's no appointed counsel. So out of um, all the immigrants who are detained, we're talking tens of thousands of people a year, um, there's 14% of detained immigrants have a lawyer. That's including children. You know, once someone has a lawyer, they are at least like two to four times more likely to win their case. Um, so that's a really big issue we're facing here, of people not having access to counsel. You see that about $25 billion on average a year is spent towards emergency humanitarian response. Tents, food, with the idea that you'll go home at some point, but people don't go home. So in 2015, the World Food Program had to cut 1.7 million Syrian refugees off of food. And they looked at the fact that their children were going to starve and their children didn't have access to food or, or education and felt that they had no other options than to risk their lives on the waters and in the backs of trucks to try to get their families to safety. Last year, the United States took 11 Syrians. That's what we took, 11. And in take a country like Lebanon, four million people in the country of Lebanon, that's the size of Los Angeles, took a million refugees. So it gives you some context into what we're not doing and what others are. You know, the Zattery camp, I've, I've worked there every year since it opened, and um, you know, it started as tents, it was built for 20,000, it has 100 and I think 30 something thousand living there now. They are living in little, con like I, we call them containers, but they are like little trailers basically except they have no wheels, but they're <laughs> on the ground, these little like shacks made, you know, that are there. Um, and it's a city now. The thing that I think most of us don't realize is people want to go home. They really don't want to come here or to Europe or, you know, they want to go home. That's where they want to be to, to a T. Everyone, and I think you've experienced this in every country, if they had their choice, it's home in safety. 
And unfortunately, as a world, we can't secure safety for them. I'm just reflecting on what y'all are saying and um, thinking about how there are like so many people I've met who are refugees and the most brave, inspiring people ever and, and certainly did not want to leave their countries. My first client was a refugee, uh, a young doctor who was a 26-year-old from Ethiopia um, who was tortured by the government because he spoke out against the corruption in the local hospital for poor people that he was serving for his patients. So, I mean, he was brutally tortured. His whole family was there and certainly did not want to leave. His mission was to be serving the poor people of this country. Um, and just an example of, of the really inspiring people who are willing to speak up. There is an amazing tenacity of human spirit. And I think if I think about solutions and hope, um, if you could talk to the people in these camps, they have not given up hope. They still believe tomorrow is going to be a better day, that we're, the world isn't going to leave them there forever. Um, and you're seeing now corporations taking back office work in, in again, in, in Jordan, in the Zattery camp, you see it in Lebanon in some of the camps where you have the opportunity. These people cannot work in the host countries, but they can work for American companies in the camp. Um, so you see jobs, back office jobs. Many of these people are educated. They have the capacity to do the jobs you need done. And you're seeing that start to happen. Um, you are also seeing a big push for, obviously, for education because we will lose an entire generation otherwise. So a great deal of, of emphasis on education in, these, in all of the camps. The whole humanitarian response paradigm of emergency support, tents, food, and assistance until you can go home is no longer fit for the magnitude of this global crisis. So what do we do? What we have to do is find ways for refugees to become self-reliant so they can care for their families and so they can contribute to their new communities. That's what refugees tell us they want. Don't let me depend on that food. I don't know if it's going to be here tomorrow. Let me support myself. We've brought together staff from the State Department, from the IKEA Foundation, from the UN Refugee Agency, from IRC and Mercy Corps, and some of the biggest global responders in the world to collectively come up with common goals and common ways of approaching those goals. I love what David Rubenstein said earlier today. He quoted Reagan, and I'm probably missing this precise quote, but that you can accomplish anything you want if you don't take credit. And that really struck me, because what I find is that if you can unite a field around common goals and common ways of doing things, you can accomplish a great deal. I think it is important to continually highlight those positive, real stories about contributing people here. Uh, the, in that tent in the Congo, there was a 13-year-old boy who was mute because he'd been tortured so badly. He was one of the ones that got here. He became a national track star, went to high school, went to college, got a master's degree, and started uh, coaching. And you see time after time people who are contributing. But I also, I wanted to just throw a little more, um, we had a kind of mutual love going on here. I wanted to throw a little more love at yeah. Dina's way. Just, just to say that, so Brown CEO this morning said something that really struck me. He said, what is my responsibility? What do I have to do today? And I think we all have to ask ourselves that. What is our responsibility? <laughs>